Hi, I am Bill Simmons, Artistic Director of the Phoenix Theater Cultural Center in beautiful downtown Indianapolis. And today, my guest for today's installment of One to One with Bill Simmons is Constance Macy, um, a friend of mine for many, many years, a consummate theater maker, uh, actor, director, teacher. Uh, and she is directing our current production, Bakersfield Bis by Stephen Sachs. How are you, Constance? I'm good. Thanks, Bill. Thanks for having me on your little Zoom. <laughs> so how's the show going? You're in the midst of rehearsals as we're recording this. Uh, it's going. It's coming right along. We just have one more day in the rehearsal room before we move on to the stage tomorrow. So I'm excited about that. We've got Scott Russell is coming back tonight. He choreographed this brilliant um, uh, bit of violence for us. And um, so we will see him again tonight and then we'll run the show one more time. Um, I enjoy watching it every time. I mean, it's, it's fun. It's a fun, fun show. Yeah, you've done a really nice job crafting that show. You've, you've yeah. got two really, really, really accomplished and talented actors. Um, right. So when I watched the run through the other day, I was, you know, I mean, I, I saw the shape you had and I saw the work that was to be done, but you're in, I thought, wonderful shape for having been, I think I was two weeks out from opening at that point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we've used our time very wisely. You know, it's just a two-hander. So wow. um, I, I have to be careful to not exhaust the actors. They're, you know, I mean, they're both, they're not spring chicken. They're, this is a play for two people of a certain age. And, um, and so, yeah, so we scheduled, I mean, I think maybe two thirds of the time we were allotted on this contract just because you know more than four hours is just cruel it's just the two of them yeah. so i mean in a in a row you know four hours in a row yeah. and, so, and really, anyway so yeah so we haven't had what i my point is we haven't had a lot of hours together but the hours that we've had together we've um we've used well you know i i knew um kind of what i wanted this show to look like uh i had a sense of what we were going to do and i knew that, that that i had two very capable people it's just really going to be a tour de force for them it's um people are going to be impressed by them it's it's quite the marathon so maybe for those who viewers who are going to watch this uh tell us a little bit about your process so like when you got the script how you read the script what struck you um because i did present it to you as a project for you i thought you might want to direct um, yeah. So a little bit about when you got the script, your reactions to it, and how you uh, prepare to direct. Um, I wasn't sure what to make of the script when I first read it, to be honest. I didn't, um, I wasn't sure what it wanted to be. Mm -hmm. uh, I read some reviews, you know, it's been, because it's been produced a lot, actually. Um, and there are a lot of reviews out there. And um Oh, I remember there was one uh, production in particular that did not was not well received, and the reviews were saying, "Well, you know, I just I don't believe this. I don't believe that people would go from this to this, um, you know, in this seventy five minutes or whatever it is." And so, um, so that clued me in that it 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 doesn't want to be just you know your basic piece of you know realism. Um, what, and so what I discovered about it was, you know, these characters have to be extra. Um, it's just a little bit above reality. Um, it's, it's a heightened, I guess, I don't know. It has to be heightened and it has to be extra. It has to be just a teensy bit over um, what you think might be right. So yeah. um, that's where that play wants to live. And so that was sort of one of the first things I, I noticed about it. Um, which gave me then a new perspective when I went back and read it a second time. Um, it, it gave me a window in to see, to visualize how um, this play could really land. Yeah. Uh, and then I went back, you know, on all the resource material, I watched the documentary about the real story and, you know, and the real people that um, Lionel and Maude are based on, um, they're a little bit, 
more than what you might expect from a normal person. Oh yeah, right? no. When I watched the, do- I didn't see the documentary until long after we decided to schedule this play, and I was actually struck by how theatrical they were as humans. How much yeah, the life I present in the world, and I'm an actor, and I right. remember. And then the yeah, it was it was. So when I saw the run through, I thought, no, this I. I believe that had you gotten the real people in the room, something like this might have played out. Yeah, yeah, right. So, uh, <laughs> so that's been I'm, I, that's been sort of the always the the piece of it that I keep kind of throwing back into the room. I'm like, remember the style? It's you know, just I need just a little bit more, just a little bit more. Um, and it's fun. And so the actors have have you know. Because, you know, as an actor, you start from a real place. You always want to come from a real place. And right. and um, and so at first, a, a style like that, something like that being put on, it might feel like that doesn't, I don't believe that. But so they have to grow into it um, so that what they're doing is very real. And but also looks to us first meeting them very large, still feeling real to them. I, I often think of characters like, or I bring up examples of like Niles Crane um, as played by my old friend, David Right, uh, um, David Hyde Pierce, yeah, you, <laughs> you studied with him, right, up in Mil- yeah, Wisconsin? Yeah, up in Wisconsin, yeah. Um, but I love him and I love Niles. Uh, you know, Niles is, so, is way over the top. Oh. He's the most over the top character on that show. And, but yet, we feel that he's, you know, it feels very real to the actor. It's coming from a very real and genuine place. Yeah. Anyway, so that's where we are now. And, and um, everybody, I think, is feeling comfortable with what we're doing. And, and so then they can really relish it and embellish it and um, enjoy it and have fun. You know, I was telling the, um, the Phoenix team the other day, uh, uh, kind of reporting about my experience of the run through. And I was really struck by the moments of vulnerability when those two actors, Josh Coomer and Jolene Moffat, are really living in the emotional, the, the deepest part of those characters, yeah. it really plays like a really beautiful drama. And yeah. then the comedy, because it's the it's the banging together of those two personality types is where the comedy lives. But yeah. the vulnerability between the characters, when you get real truths from both of them, it's really beautiful. It's really, it's really, you've done a commendable job, I think, of taking a script that, you know, lives kind of on the page in a certain way. And then you bring the right actors to the project and the right director and the right design people. And you've got this really, it's really, it's really special. And it's all within the confines of a single wide trailer yeah. in Bakersfield, California. And it is a big, it, you don't have a gargantuan playing space and you no. keep them moving in such a way that it doesn't seem forced. It doesn't seem like the blocking is to cover up boring sections of play or actors lack of ability. No, no, you can't. Yeah. No, yeah. So no, it's that's, and that's been the joy of, of, of working it, you know, these past couple of weeks. It's just like finding where are the moments like the, where we're like building, 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 building to a joke. And then pull the rug out into this like moment of real poignancy. Um, that's been really fun to kind of orchestrate and score. Um, and I try to do a little bit, just back to the question about process. I try to do a little bit of that in, you know, on paper as I'm envisioning the play um, by myself. But the real fun is when you get in the room with the people and you're just like, you know, and just really, finding that and, and, and making that, um, that happen kind of like a conductor. Um, I was going to say something else about, uh, about that, but anyway, well, I, yeah, but that is, it's got it. Cause it's got, that's in there. It's like this, this real poignant, poignancy, poignant moments. And also, um, you know, just madcap, you know, kind of absurdism, um, comedy. So, so no. look, I have a, a, just a follow-up question to your process, because I think this is something that I, I get asked a lot by, you know, well, where do you start directing? Um, and for me, it's once I get a play that I'm going to direct, it really is, I'm a very visual person, so I still find stuff yeah. on the internet, and I actually print it out, and I create, like, collages, and I pull, pull things out of magazines. So, before, and, and one of the things that, for those people who don't know how professional 
stage productions come together, directors' concepts are the first thing that are due. Those get gathered and then they get disseminated to the design team. So what were what was your process for kind of visualizing the world that you wanted the designers to help you flesh out? Uh, I, I mean, I just wrote my thoughts. <laughs> you know, these are my thoughts about this. Yeah. And it mostly came from that, as I was saying, from that place of being just slightly an exaggerated version of something that you would expect to be true. It is a true story, you know, but it is one of those true stories that you're like, really? Um, so, well, it, or it's, I should say, it's fictionalized events based on real events. Um, but it's real people. And, and so, um, so yeah, so I wanted that sense of everything being just a little bit um, uh, beyond just that one step too far. And um, yeah, and the fact that it takes place in Bakersfield in a trailer. So I told, I was telling um, my parents about the play and, and um, and they said, do you remember when we went to Bakersfield? And I, of course, I do remember. I was like 11 and um, we had cousins there and uh, we stayed with them for a couple of days. And I remember we're like lighting bottle rockets in a strip mall parking lot with my cousin. Um, and I remember it being surrounded by desert. Like it was a little town was just like desert all around it. Uh, it was something just beyond my experience. Um, but I had read later that it was that for many years and maybe still the safest, it's considered the safest town in the United States, um, which I can totally believe, you know, because it's just kind of, it's like a little island. And what's more, um, when I was there, that, that would have been like 1978. No. Yeah. Like 78 or 79. Um, uh, my mom's brother, my aunt and uncle and their two kids, they lived in a double wide trail. They lived in a trailer park. I mean, it was a nice, it was a nice trailer park and it was a really big trailer, but yeah, that's where they lived. And, and they had a, um, uh, avocado tree. I mean, it was just everything. Like I already knew I could picture because that was my only real memory of Bakersfield was their place. And so anyway, wow, so I already what had a, in mind what that place looks like. That's awesome to be able to have that. that right. And so, but anyway, and yeah, and then the associated memories with that. So it's like, okay, how do I feel remembering that? You know, I remember that being like in this sort of carefree time. And, um, you know, we were on the verge of feral, us children, you know, as we just kind mm -hmm. of get it out to light those firecrackers and, which I think we brought with us. I think they were contraband in California at the time. And that's why, um, you know, it was so fun and exciting to light them off. It's funny you should mention the avocado green because we had my kitchen growing up in the 70s. We had yellow formica tops, which is what the color is of the trailers of uh, faux formica. But then we also had olive green appliances. And so my parents' wallpaper to make all that work was this enormous floral pattern like right off like right out of the Brady Bunch like these enormous orange and green and and, <laughs> and, and red big, right. big tropical flowers and then they had these really dark Tudor cabinets it was it was it was the darkest <laughs> kitchen um because it was east facing so it only got morning light it was so dark that walking the trailer set the other day I was it really took me down memory lane um so yeah, so actually talk a little bit about your designers because uh, yeah. what's really lovely is a number of them are old friends of ours. Um, and yeah. I always find that that's really nice to work with friends on creating art together because you have a common, you know, you'll have a long history and a common language. Yeah, yeah. So, um, well, we'll start, let's start with the trailer. The set is being designed by um, Zach Hunter who works at the Phoenix Theater. Right. Um, so he's made, a trailer, you know, and we talked about from the beginning, that, yes, we want a real trailer. We want to be able to see some of the outside of the trailer so that, um, so we get the, the whole, um, just sort of the whole aesthetic and the whole feeling of being in a trailer park yeah. um, and being in Bakersfield, California, where, you know, 
it's always summertime, you know, pretty much. Um, and so, yeah, so the trailer then is, and the character Maud is, you know, she's a scavenger. She's a collector of sorts. And, um, so there's a ton of stuff in her trailer. Um, and Zach and I talked a lot about what kind of stuff that was, you know, she, yes, she's a trash picker. She says in the play, yeah, I pick through the trash. Um, everything you see before you comes from someone else's trash. Uh, but I wanted it to be, you know, interesting and fun and, um, you know, an inviting place. I mean, the place that we want to spend 75 minutes in as right. an audience. Yeah, it needs and, to be visually, like, it needs to be visually a, its own character. Right, right. So, um, and also, you know, this play is about art and, you know, Pollock and all of that. And so I wanted all of that sense in there too, that this sort of mess, like a sort of, at first glance, a chaotic mess, but actually um, a deliberate and inviting thing. Right. That was sort right. of my, the metaphor to the painting. Um, so anyway, uh, Zach designed that. And then we talked to uh, my friend, Bunny, our friend, Andrea Hastings, um, is an old friend of yours and mine. And right. she, yeah. um, she is a collector of things and uh, antiques and mostly like a lot of mid-century stuff, bric-a-brac and signs and wall hangings and what have you. Right. Um, she has all that, that all of that. And, she, and, and, she's, uh, and she works with Dan Ripley Antiques. So she's actually a knowledgeable dealer about like what things are worth. And, right, uh, right. So, uh, so yeah, so we have Bun basically dressing the set. I mean, um, Zach, of course, is, you know, is dressing the set, but Bud is bringing all these things in, sort of curating all this stuff, um, right. bringing it to us. Um, and we're putting a lot of it on the set. Um, and then all of that stuff will be for, will be for sale. So, um, you know, as, as your people are watching the play, I don't know if there'll be a program insert or something that lists the prices or the price range of all of these things and people can buy them. I think there's a discussion of a QR, a QR code that you'd be able to scan and it'll take you to the auction site. There um, you go. And, you'll, and there'll be a fixed price for each item, kind of like, you know, an eBay buy it now price. Right, yeah. So all this fun stuff, you know, lava lamps and uh, what have you, you know, right. it's like, I can't even, you know, cookie jars and bar glasses. Um, it'll all be for sale. Yeah. So that's fun. Uh, because it feels kind of like, you know, because Maud, you know, she's a yard sailor, she has yard sales. And so I, it's a, yet again, just another layer to this piece that we've added on. That's fun. Um, yeah. we're really embracing the fun this holiday season yeah it's um, it's, it's visually it's just a stun. it's gonna be a stunning set yeah and then um another good friend of ours tony smith is um cost put doing the designing the costumes for us um and so yeah and that's, there's just the two characters there's just a huge juxtaposition between them um uh you know just culturally uh um uh, class there's classism um education gap and um all of that and so uh tony is is dressing them to those extremes so that'll be great i'm, I'm really anxious to see what jolene is wearing i mean i've seen it but i want to see it all on right um so and then who else quentin james is a lighting designer that i've worked with um before when I directed Into the Woods for Summerstock, I worked with Quentin. Right. And uh, he did beautiful work on that. And so I'm anxious to work with him again. Um, Scott Russell, I already mentioned, is a, a fight choreographer, a movement guy. And um, he's been a great, great help on this. We've, he's already been in a couple of times and he's coming back today because we had to make a few adjustments we were just getting hurt. It's carpet, you know, yeah. and it's carpet in the rehearsal room and it's the same carpet that's in the trailer on the set. So right. um, 
we were Jolene was just getting rug burns every night. And so we had to um uh, adjust and fight a little bit. And but it's still big and absurd. I mean, it's still it didn't lose anything, but Scott's just coming back in to make sure we didn't do something dangerous. Right. Um it looked great the other day in the run through. It looked it looked theatrical, it looked funny, it looked dangerous. Yeah. It was surprising having watched and been in, you know, choreographed in a lot of fights in my career or, or as a director watching them. And I and I sat there and I was I was was surprised and shocked and frightened and laughed and uh, all within the space. It probably looked really only about 35 to 45 seconds, maybe. Yeah, it's a lot shorter than it seems, yeah, for sure. Yeah. And then Todd Reichman. Our Todd good Reichman. Oh, that's right. <laughs> Todd. Yes. <laughs> and the sound design is a character too. I mean, it's, um, there isn't a lot, but, um, <laughs> but when, but when it's there, it's, it's funny and um, yeah, really propels the piece along. So um, yeah. Bless Which, Todd Reichman. He is really talented. He's extremely talented. And I and I will confess, I didn't know much about the Bakersfield sound. I didn't know that that's a, a like a genre or subset of like rockabilly. Buck Owens and the Buckaroos. Yeah. Remember Buck Owens from Hee Haw? Yeah. Oh yeah. I remember. I don't. We didn't watch He's a lot of the inventor of the like Bakersfield sound. I didn't know that until recently. Yeah, I I did not know that either. But when when you all were talking about that at the read through. If it, it, that Buck Owens and the Buccaneers, is that what it was? I thought they were the Buckaroos. Buckaroos, right. There's something in my memory bank clicked in and I must have read that somewhere about him or something like that. Um, <laughs> but yeah, now I remember um, my, when my dad's folks would come out for visits, Hee Haw was always, what yep. was how, we had to watch Hee Haw when they were out. Um, Cause my grandmother had been a yodeler on radio in the thirties. And so that whole, that show, Yes, totally got it. Um, so, uh, like, one of the, what do you think, like, the the takeaways might be for an audience? I mean, it's it's obviously going to be a very entertaining show, um, but what are some of the, they may or may not get this, but what are some of the things that have been going through your mind as you've been watching rehearsals and working with your actors on building the world of this play? Like, thematically, you mean? Yeah, I mean, it, it really, like I said, it lived, lived in a much deeper place than, um, than I had read on the page. Um, yeah. So, yeah, so one of the things we've been uh, working on is somebody said after the, um, after the designers watched a run through, one of them said, oh, I don't hate Lionel. And I thought, well, thank God, because, you know, with two, with two people, you have to be rooting for them both. You know, yeah. you can't, you can't just have a protagonist and an antagonist, you know, that's just not interesting. Right. Right. For a whole play. Yes. I think so, that's, yeah. Um, so anyway, so yeah, we worked on finding the um, the humanity in them both in the places where the audience relates to each of them. Um, and, you know, you're on, you, you might align with him or her um, throughout. And I hope that that will shift back and forth. And so, um, but in the end, I think you should be rooting for them both. And so, um, yeah, we looked for moments where they find shared, uh, um, whatever, the, just uh, where they share their hearts and they find that they align. Um, just moments where they're together mm -hmm. um, and not just, you know, because not just to have this whole, not the whole time just fighting, you know what I mean? So yeah. um, anyway, so that's, I guess, something that we've talked about is like, um, yeah how do we relate to both of these people from our own perspectives? Yeah. It's a play that I hope people will um, want to talk about after it's, it's a mystery um, that it really is up to you to solve. And so, um, and so there's, there's that I, I, and I would hate to um, kind of influence your decision in the end 
with you not liking one of these people. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. yeah, and it's hard because they're not they're not like, and that's why this the I think it was Quentin maybe who said that. Then that's why because on the page Lionel is not likable at all. Right. You know, he's really a, an elitist, and yeah. um, but fleshed out and in front of us, he's more than that. So it's I guess that there's that lesson to be learned too. It's like yeah, people aren't what you just read, you know, people well, are I, so much what, more. What really struck me too in the play was what she's asking him to do, if he agreed to that, would be compromising who he is as a human. And I think that was the thing that really came through to me was he couldn't compromise, he, he, he he couldn't compromise himself to, to grant her, to fulfill her needs. And, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I could tell he struggled with it. Um, so yeah, I don't want to, I guess, talk too much more about that, but, but yeah, it really, um, I find myself, like you said, at different points in time, rooting for one over the other, but yet at the end of the play, seeing both of them very, very clearly and having, and because of having taken that journey with them, it made me uh it made me actually feel compassion toward both of them um and yeah. still was funny i still was highly entertained by the whole 75 minutes of it yeah well and that's been you know part of it too is just finding just technically and like logistically working out what we have to do to make the audience live in this place where we want them to live that's just a little bit um there's just a little bit of rope suspending our disbelief um, and make the moments land when the, you know, if, if we're going from outrageous to, you know, uh, I'm letting my heart bleed here, you know, it's gotta, it's gotta land. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, so there's been a lot of like timing and uh, timing work and, I don't know, just really kind of minutia is where we're living now in the minutia of it so that it's um, so that we squeeze out of it all of the potential that we can. So it's never just um, it's never just the words that you read, you know, like anybody can read a play. I want to bring you, you know, so much more. Yeah. So. Yeah, well, it was, it yeah, it was heading. And I, 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 totally recognize the work that had been done and I could very clearly see what was coming. And that, so I wasn't, I didn't leave that run through thinking, oh my gosh, they're not gonna make it. I thought, oh, they're gonna have a lot of time to land this plane um, and it's not gonna be a panicky situation. This is a play well within our wheelhouse, well within your wheelhouse, the actors and the designers. And that actually brings me to my last question. So you and I are theater makers of a certain age and, and these characters are people of a certain age. And do you mm -hmm. feel like, this was a project that you were ready for now that you might not have been ready for when you were 35 or 40 as a director? Oh, sure. Oh yeah, I'm sure. Um, I feel like, yeah, I, I get these people, right. And I, and I have met people like this and, um, and so, and yeah, and just the sort of absurdity of, just the preciousness of art, um, how it pretentious it yeah. is. I mean, I think it's taken me, I mean, you know, I love the theater, obviously I'm still making theater, but I, I have come to a place in my life where I can kind of look at the sort of caricature, I, you know, that, that it is, yes. um, it's like almost like a cartoon strip and I can recognize that that's absurd. Yeah. Whereas, you know, 10 years ago, I was just too much in it, you know? Yes. Um. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm right there with you. I'm right there with you. During, about three months ago, um, our friend Lori Hudson, who runs the, new, the artistic director of the New Harmony Project, recommended Jen Silverman's book, We Play Ourselves. And I know oh, we like were, just finished reading We Play Ourselves. And I thought to myself, I texted Lori, I said, this play, this novel is every theater situation I have been in. Good, bad, horrific, satisfying, yep. ridiculous. And at the end of the day, I'm like, this business, what is the point of this? This is, a, this is, you know, 
Yes. Um, I literally just finished reading that book. And, um, oh, I just remember one of the character Helene saying, um, oh, yeah. <laughs> she said, oh shoot, something about like theater, theater only seems like the epitome of success to those of us in the cult. Exactly. And everybody I, else were just wasting our best years. I yes, wrote I that love that in line. My journal. I wrote that very sentence. Theater <laughs> only matters to those of us in the cult. And I thought that is exactly right. Because even my, you know, our spouses or your husband's a theater maker. Mine is an attorney. And she's like, Bill, you're not saving babies at that place. That's <laughs> right. No, that's, it's not the NICU. It is not the NICU. And as no. my friend, old friend Ken Albers used to always say, it's the toy department of life. <laughs> um, but yeah, so yeah so it's fun out. to to have a character that's so so precious about yeah. the art world in which he dwells yeah. you know juxtaposed with somebody who doesn't know shit about it who's just like okay you know yeah. it's real fun to watch it's funny I, I get the new york times bulletin and i think it was last night or the night before it came through like eight o'clock that some auction of frida callow painting and so oh, i saw 30, that yeah 38 million dollars and it's the highest price that anybody's paid for a latinx woman right. painter right but i'm still thinking it's paint on the canvas it's is it really 38 million dollars worth I of know. value and someone bought a Pollock for like 140 million. That's the highest anybody's ever paid for a painting. A Jackson Pollock, 140 million dollars. Yeah. Nobody's going to do that again. I mean, after, did you see the documentary called Made You Look? And it was about this guy who lived, he like lived in Queens or something and he painted Pollocks and Rothko's and signed them even. And one of them, he misspelled Pollock in the signature and somebody bought it for millions of dollars from, I mean, this gallery took them and sold them. And so anyway, the documentary is about, you know, did the gallery know what they were doing or that, or, you know, are they, it, were they taken as well as what they claim? Oh, but, I uh, did you watch it? Yeah, yeah. It's on Netflix or something. It's called made you look. Yeah. Did um, you watch it as research for this or just something you. Uh huh. I did. Yeah, because Josh told me about it. Um, and so, and it's just kind of a window into that, again, that other world where it's just like, are you for real? You know, what wh how, What were the steps that brought you to this place where you dwell? <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, it's something else. Well, so anyway. This has been oh, a yes. delight. To answer your question, yes. I feel like this is a good time for me um, to be directing a story like this. Yeah. No, I feel it. I could feel it in the room when I was there over the weekend. And I could tell the actors feel like the show is well in hand. And the design, I mean, it was just a really good vibe in a rehearsal room. And I'm old enough, too, to be like, oh, there's a lot of tension in this room. Um, yeah, right. I, whether I'm in it or I'm the creator of the tension because I'm directing it or whatever that is, but I walked in and everybody, and you know, there's still a pandemic going on. And I thought, well, here's a space where theater makers are making theater that they're feeling really good about. Um, and is it feels, it feels magical right now. And that's a real treat. And I, I've been blessed because I saw three things. I saw a play and development in Chicago, the Magnolia Ballet that we're developing for the springtime. Then I saw my, our friend Claire Wilcher made her directorial debut at Michigan State. Right. A play called Wendy and the Neckbeards, which is about a, um, a woman who is fat body positive and she has a, she's a blogger and she's trolled by these neckbeards. And I knew nothing about that culture until Claire was telling me about it. And it was so awesome to see college kids watching college kids tell a story that was about them. So the energy in the space was awesome. And then coming to the run through on Saturday, and just seeing how this thing is really coming together. So it makes me, it's its again, inspired me to keep going as a theater artist. Cause I'm like, well, something's happening again. Finally, after this long, 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 dark hiatus, there's some really great yeah. things coming along. Well, kudos to you, my friend, because it's gonna be, a, like you said, a tour de force for those two. And, oh my gosh, um, totally. Yeah, and I'm really, really proud that this is gonna be our holiday offering this year. Cause it's gonna be, Gonna have a little flavor of the holidays, but nothing really specifically about the holidays. So, yep, yeah, exactly. All right, my friend, we'll carry on. Thanks for the time and uh, break legs with the rest of the project. Okay, Bill.
All right. Bye. See ya.